The city-states of ancient Greece, like the vast majority of ancient cultures, operated within a predominantly male-dominated societal framework. However, it is crucial to recognize that women's rights diverged significantly between regions and cities. In most city-states, women had no political rights, no inheritance rights, and with rare exceptions, access to education was denied to them. Notably, Athens was the city where women had among the fewest rights in all of ancient Greece. However, there were city-states that defied these norms, such as Mytilene in the island of Lesvos and Gorton in the island of Crete. The most renowned example, though, was Sparta. Spartan women, while unable to participate in the state's affairs, received education from a young age, primarily focused on physical training, and for a considerable part of Sparta's history, women had the right to own property. An intriguing event of ancient Greece was the Herea, a women-only version of the Olympic Games held every four years. This event allowed women, who were otherwise prohibited from watching the Olympics, to actively participate in sports. Overall, ancient Greek society placed considerable emphasis on women marrying at a young age and fulfilling domestic roles, which included child-rearing and household management. Women were largely confined to the private sphere and participation in various public activities such as going to the market was restricted. One notable exception was their involvement in religion. Women played vital roles as priestesses and oracles, some of which were held in high esteem. They actively participated in religious festivals, some of which were exclusively for women. While this overview simplifies the complexities of the era, it offers a general perspective on the status and roles of women in ancient Greece. Having said that, there were some women that stood out and made a clear impact during those times. In this video, we will show five renowned ancient Greek women from the archaic and classical periods who gained worldwide fame over the years for their remarkable achievements. Number 1. Aspasia Aspasia was the wife of Pericles, the famous Athenian statesman and orator who ruled Athens during its Golden Age and oversaw the construction of the Parthenon. Ancient Greek sources present two contrasting views of Aspasia. On one hand, she is depicted as a brilliant intellectual, while on the other, she is portrayed as a concubine who wielded significant influence over Pericles, often manipulating him with her clever wits. Aspasia was born around 470 BC in the Greek city of Miletus, which is situated on the western coast of Anatolia in modern-day Turkey. When she was approximately 20 years old, she relocated to Athens and settled there as a metic, a status granted to non-Athenian residents who wished to live in Athens. Metics lacked full citizenship rights and were required to pay additional taxes for their residents. According to historical sources such as Plutarch and Athenian comedic writers like Aristophanes, during her time in Athens, Aspasia became a hetera, a courtesan of high social standing, and established her own house of young courtesans. Shortly thereafter, she met Pericles, and the two developed a deep romantic relationship. Pericles was already married and had two sons, but in 455 BC, he divorced his wife and wed Aspasia. Together, they had a son who took his father's name. However, the son was considered illegitimate because, according to Athenian law, both parents needed to be Athenian citizens for a child to be deemed legitimate. Ironically, it was Pericles himself who had introduced this law a few years earlier. Pericles and Aspasia developed a deep love for each other. According to Plutarch, Twice a day, as they say, on going out and returning from the marketplace, he would greet her with a loving kiss. This affectionate relationship appeared unusual to many conservative Athenians, and the political enemies of Pericles took advantage of the situation, often criticizing him for openly displaying his love and accusing him of being manipulated by his wife. Aspasia frequently found herself as the subject of ridicule by the Athenian comedians, a fact evident from the surviving fragments of their works. In one of the plays of Cratinus, there's a line that reads, As his hera, Aspasia was born, the child of unnatural lust, a prostitute beyond shaming. 
Plutarch also mentions that Aspasia was accused by some of inciting a conflict between Athens and the city-state of Samos. The Samians accused her of influencing Pericles to engage in the war due to her connection with her hometown Miletus, which had a long history of hostility with Samos. At one point, a man named Hermippius, likely acting on the instigation of Pericles' political enemies, accused Aspasia of impiety, leading to her trial. She was specifically accused of receiving freeborn women into a place of assignation for Pericles. During her trial, Pericles passionately spoke in her defence to the point of shedding tears. When the case concluded, Aspasia was found not guilty. Beyond her reputation as a concubine and the slander she faced from a portion of the Athenian elite, there is another, much more interesting aspect of Aspasia presented in historical sources. In these accounts, she is portrayed as a remarkably wise and educated individual with mastery in oration, eloquence and language. She is credited with teaching many notable men, including some of Athens' most prominent figures such as her husband Pericles, who, as it is often stated, was the most exceptional orator Athens had ever seen. Importantly, it is also said that she was one of the teachers of Socrates, one of the most famous philosophers of ancient Greece. These details about Aspasius' life can be found in the works of philosophers like Plato, Xenophon and Aeschines, as well as in the writings of the historian Plutarch. In the following fragment from the dialogue of Aeschines, Aspasia talks with the philosopher Xenophon and his wife. Through the method of inductive reasoning, Aspasia explains to them that both should aspire to become the perfect partner for each other instead of yearning for an ideal mate. Please tell me, wife of Xenophon, if your neighbour had a better gold ornament than you have, would you prefer that one or your own? That one, she replied. Now, if she had dresses and other feminine finery more expensive than you have, would you prefer yours or hers? Hers, of course, she replied. Well now, if she had a better husband than you have, would you prefer your husband or hers? At this, the woman blushed, but Aspasia then began to speak to Xenophon. I wish you would tell me, Xenophon, if your neighbour had a better horse than yours, would you prefer your horse or his? His was his answer. And if he had a better farm than you have, which farm would you prefer to have? The better farm, naturally. Now, if he had a better wife than you have, would you prefer yours or his? And at this, Xenophon too himself was silent. Then Aspasia said, Since both of you have failed to tell me the only thing I wish to hear, I myself will tell you what you both are thinking. That is, you, my lady, wish to have the best husband, and you, Xenophon, desire above all things to have the finest wife. Therefore, unless you can contrive that there be no better man or finer woman on earth, you will certainly always be in dire want of what you consider best, Namely, that you be the husband of the very best of wives and that she be wedded to the very best of men. In his work, Plutarch confirms that Aspasia was renowned and respected by the intellectuals of Athens, stating, And so, Aspasia, as some say, was held in high favour by Pericles because of her rare political wisdom. Socrates sometimes came to see her with his disciples and his intimate friends brought their wives to her to hear her discourse. And in one of Plato's works, Socrates speaks with Menexenus, telling him, That I should be able to speak is no great wonder, Menexenus, considering that I have an excellent mistress in the art of rhetoric. She who has made so many good speakers and one who was the best among all the Greeks, Pericles, the son of Xanthippus said Socrates, referring to Aspasia. It's interesting to observe that within the philosophical texts, there is a conspicuous absence of any reference to Aspasia in the role of a concubine. At this point in history, Athens had ascended to the zenith of its political influence, boasting an empire with immense wealth and naval supremacy across the Aegean. However, this status was soon shattered by the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War, which started in 431 BC. Athens, along with its allies, clashed with Sparta and its allies in a long and brutal conflict. 
Two years after the outbreak of the war, Athens was hit by a devastating plague that claimed the lives of thousands, including Pericles, leaving Aspasia widowed. Sometime after Pericles' death, Aspasia entered a relationship with his friend Lysicles, who lost his life a year later while serving in the Peloponnesian War's campaign in Caria, a region in South Anatolia. Following these events, Aspasia disappears from the historical records. Aspasia left an enduring legacy as later Greek and Roman writers portrayed her as one of the most celebrated and intellectually accomplished women in history. Number 2. Sappho Sappho was the most famous female poet in all of the ancient world. She was born on the Greek island of Lesbos around 630 BC, specifically in the city of Erisos. However, she grew up in the nearby city-state of Mytilene. As previously mentioned, Lesbos offered women a somewhat greater degree of freedom in comparison to the majority of regions and city-states in ancient Greece. Sappho was from a wealthy family which was involved in wine production and export. Her own occupation remains uncertain. Many have tried to ascertain it primarily by interpreting her poems and speculating about various roles, such as that of a priestess, a weaver, or even an athletic trainer. There is a single source suggesting she might have been a schoolmistress, but its credibility is questionable given that it was written 16 centuries after her death. What is known is that Sappho received an early education in poetry and music, becoming proficient in playing the ancient Greek lyre. As a result, she engaged in lyric poetry. The term lyric in lyric poetry stems from its characteristic use of music, particularly the Greek lyre, as an accompaniment. Not long after, she began composing her own poems. These works were written in the Aeolic Greek dialect, which was spoken in Lesbos, Boeotia, Thessaly and northwestern Anatolia. Additionally, she incorporated some Homeric Greek words similar to those found in the Iliad and the Odyssey into her poetry. Sappho is credited with inventing a new poetic meter known as the Sapphic stanza and the majority of her poems followed this structure. In the Sapphic stanza, three longer lines of the same length are followed by a fourth, shorter one. This meter would later become popular and was even adopted by early modern European poets. In an era dominated by poetry focused on war and glory, Sappho pioneered a groundbreaking shift as the first poet to extensively explore the theme of love in all its diverse forms. While she did write on other subjects, love remained the primary theme of her poetry. She famously said, some say that the fairest thing upon the dark earth is a host of horsemen, and some say a host of foot soldiers, and others again a fleet of ships, but for me, it is my beloved. Her love poems predominantly centered on female homoerotic love. Despite writing in the Aeolic dialect, which was considered somewhat odd-sounding to the rest of the Greeks, it didn't take long for all of Greece to begin admiring Sappho for her poetry. She swiftly emerged as one of the most renowned poets of her time and later established herself as the greatest female poet in ancient Greece, to the extent that some of her phrases became integrated into everyday Greek language. Numerous famous Greek intellectuals, including Plato, praised her and she came to be celebrated as the 10th muse. Sappho's later personal life is shrouded in mystery. One pivotal event, supported by actual evidence, was her exile to Sicily. This exile was prompted by a tumultuous period of political unrest in Lesbos, which might have involved her family's connections to the political elites of the time. After a few years though, she returned to the island. Throughout her life, Sappho's personal relationships and family ties remain elusive. There are suggestions that she may have been married at some point. It is also believed that she had a daughter named Clays, possibly named after her own mother. Regarding her old age, details remain elusive. The time and circumstances of Sappho's death also remain a mystery. 
Greek comedy playwright Menandes legend suggests that she met her end by leaping from the cliffs of the island of Lefkada, supposedly due to unrequited love for a handsome ferryman named Phaeon. However, historians, including the ancient Greek writer Strabo, have long discredited this account. The Lucadian cliffs were known for their association with lovers' leaps, but the idea of Sappho's demise over a man appears unlikely. Following her passing, Sappho's work became even more widely recognized. Additionally, depictions of her started appearing on vases, coins, and statues. The city-state of Mytilene minted coins with Sappho up until the 3rd century AD. The story of how Sappho's poems have survived is rather interesting. In her own lifetime, and for several centuries thereafter, the means by which her poetry was published and circulated remain unknown. It wasn't until the era of Alexandrian scholarship during the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC that what remained of her work was meticulously collected and published. This compilation presented her lyrical verses in nine books, neatly divided according to their perspective meters. This edition, like many others, did not stand the test of time and gradually faded from prominence. By the 8th or 9th century AD, the poetic legacy of Sappho was reduced to mere fragments quoted in the works of other authors. Among these fragments, only one ode to Aphrodite remains fully intact today. However, the discovery of ancient papyrus fragments has somewhat expanded our knowledge of her work. Today, we possess around 700 lines of Sappho's poetry. While it may seem that relatively few lines have survived, considering the dialect, genre, and the time period in which she composed, this collection is nothing short of astonishing. It's important to keep in mind that a significant portion of the writings of other poets, including the majority of other lyric poets, has been completely lost. What is equally interesting is the perspective of later scholars regarding the sexuality of Sappho, which exhibited a wide range of opinions that evolved over the centuries influenced by the cultural, social, and religious contexts of different eras. It is evident that Sappho had same-sex desires, as revealed in her poems, particularly her intimate verses dedicated to her female lovers, which vividly express her passion for women. Furthermore, in one of her fragments, she alludes to a personal experience that hints at a sexual encounter with another woman. Despite this, the portrayal of Sappho in Athenian comedies of the late 5th and 4th centuries BC often depicted her as passionately desiring men rather than women. This portrayal may have been influenced by Athens's more conservative stance on women. It's important to note that Athenian comedies should not be regarded as sources of historical accuracy, but they do provide insight into how ancient Athenians and many other Greeks perceived Sappho during that era. Moreover, it seems that the Athenian comic playwrights had a significant influence on the Roman perception of Sappho. The majority of ancient Roman authors treated the notion of Sappho's erotic relationships with other women as a malicious slander, insisting that her relationships with women were purely platonic. However, this doesn't align with the content of many of Sappho's poems, where she openly discusses her own experiences of intimacy with other women. Early Christians had mixed opinions on Sappho. Some of them regarded her as immodest due to the erotic themes of her poems. However, some Christian intellectuals like Clement of Alexandria deeply admired her work. As shown in medieval Greek manuscripts, the Byzantines persistently rejected claims of her involvement in erotic relationships with women as slander. The truth of the matter is that Sappho's poems strongly suggest her homosexuality, leaving little room for alternative interpretations. If she was not exclusively homosexual, then it's possible she may have been bisexual, given hints, as previously mentioned, that she was married at some point and had a daughter. However, it is intriguing that these scholars rejected the notion of Sappho's homoeroticism while in the same time preserving her homoerotic poems. Sappho achieved two significant milestones. 
she became a celebrated figure for her poetry in the ancient world. And as we said, she was the first poet to extensively explore themes of love and personal intimacy at a time when poetry was predominantly focused on military themes. Sappho emerged as the most renowned female poet in the Western literary tradition and maintained that status throughout history. Number 3. Telesila Telesila was a renowned lyric poet who achieved fame not only for her poetry but also for her deeds during a war with the Spartans. Unfortunately, not much is known about her life. She was born in the city of Argos during the late 6th century BC and hailed from an aristocratic family. According to the historian Plutarch, Telesila suffered from continual illness as a child. She sought guidance from an oracle who advised her to dedicate her life to the muses, the goddesses of the arts and sciences. Following the oracle's counsel, according to Plutarch, Telesila experienced healing and wholeheartedly devoted herself to the study of poetry and music. When she began composing her own poems, she quickly became a beloved figure in her home city of Argos and before long her poetry spread throughout Greece. Unfortunately, only four complete lines of her work have survived. Two of these lines are from a hymn to the goddess Artemis and the other two are from a hymn to the god Apollo. Based on these fragments and later sources that mention her work, it is reasonable to assume that she primarily wrote religious poems. Telesila is credited with introducing a metrical innovation in lyric poetry known as the Telesilian meter. However, due to the lack of surviving poems, the exact nature of this poetic meter remains unknown. Her poetry gained widespread fame and we have evidence of many later scholars including Athenaeus, Apollodorus and Maximus of Tyre who mention her work. Antipater of Thessalonica, a Greco-Roman scholar, included her in his list of the nine female lyric poets of Greece. However, as we mentioned, Telesila is equally remembered for her heroic deeds. Around 494 to 493 BC, Sparta under King Cleomenes I invaded Argos and a great battle took place outside of the city. The Argives were crushed and those who survived fled to the sacred grove of Argos and claimed sacred sanctuary from the gods. The famous historian Pausanias writes, Cleomenes questioned his Argive prisoners as to the names of those in hiding and once he had these names sent a herald to call them out personally and to guarantee their safety. But as each man came out of the sanctuary, Cleomenes had him killed. This went on until one of the men remaining in the sacred grove climbed the tree and saw what was going on outside of the sanctuary. Afterwards, of course, no other Argive answered the call of Cleomenes. Since he could not get any more Argives to come out willingly, he set fire to the grove and the rest of the men died in that fire. According to the ancient writers, the vast majority of the men of Argos were killed and Cleomenes marched to take the city itself. However, something outstanding happened. According to both Plutarch and Pausanias, Telesila, overtaken by the duty of common good and the love she had for her hometown, rallied the Argives for the defense of their city. Pausanias writes, But Telesila took all the slaves and all such male citizens who through youth or age had been unable to bear arms and made them man the walls and gathering together all their weapons of war that had been left in their houses or were hanging in the temples, armed the younger women and marshaled them at a place she knew the enemy must pass. There, undismayed by their war cry, the women stood their ground and fought with the greatest determination until the Spartans, reflecting that the slaughter of an army of women would be an equivocal victory and defeat at their hands would be dishonor as well as disaster, laid down their arms. Plutarch also notes that Demaritus, the other Spartan king, managed to sneak to the city and captured some part of it, but he too was ultimately driven out. According to Pausanias, the battle had been foretold by the Oracle of Delphi in the writings of Herodotus with the following quote, When male by female is put to flight, and Argus's name with honor is bright, many an Argive wife will show, both cheeks smart with scars of woe. 
After the battle, the fallen women were buried near the Argive Road. To commemorate their valour, a statue of Ares, the god of war, was erected at that spot. According to Plutarch, the city of Argos, in order to commemorate the event, held annually during the anniversary of the battle, the Festival of Impudence, where the women donned men's shirts and cloaks, while the men wore women's robes and veils. In the aftermath of the battle, since most of the men of Argos had been killed, the women had to remarry. According to Herodotus, the state of Argus, in order to honour the women, decided not to marry them with male slaves from Argus as they were supposed to. Instead, they decided to wed their women to the best of the neighbouring subjects, granting these individuals the status of Argive citizenship. However, Plutarch says that the Argive women showed disrespect and indifference to their new husbands, and after having fought in the battle, did not wish to be confined once again. Therefore, the Argive state enacted a law which proclaimed that married women having a beard must occupy the same bed with their husbands. The phrase women with beards is often seen as a metaphor for women who took on traditionally male roles in defending the city. These legislative measures were aimed at reaffirming the traditional values and norms that had prevailed before the battle. The Battle of Argus, or rather specifically the part of involving Telesila, has been a subject of ongoing debate among historians. This is because Herodotus, who is the most contemporary source on the matter, in his account of the events, curiously leaves out any mention of Telesila. Another theory suggests that Telesila may have influenced the resistance of Argus through her poetry, although there's no concrete evidence to support the idea that her compositions were martial in nature. Her focus was primarily on religious poetry. Nonetheless, Telesilus' enduring fame and the multitude of later sources allude to the likelihood of her playing a significant role in the conflict, even if the details remain disputed. The fate of Telesila after the battle is unknown, though it is widely believed that she continued composing poems in Argus. The bravery of Telesila earned praise from famous scholars for centuries. Plutarch writes that of all the deeds performed by women for their community, none is more famous than the struggle against Cleomenes for Argus, which the women carried out at the instigation of Telesila, the poet. Pausanias, in his work, The Description of Greece, mentions a temple dedicated to the goddess Aphrodite above the theatre of Argus. In front of the goddess's statue stood a stele adorned with an image of Telesila. This monument served as a tribute to her, celebrating both her poetic talents and her heroic accomplishments. Number 4. Artemisia Artemisia is known for her great valour in battle and her strategic wisdom. She was born during the late 6th or early 5th century BC in the region of Caria, situated in southwestern Anatolia. At that time, Caria was under the rule of the Persian Empire. Her father, Lyctimus, served as the satrap or ruler of the Greek city of Halicarnassus, while her mother hailed from Crete. At some point, she married a member of a noble family, and when her father died, her husband became the ruler of the city. However, not long after, he also passed away, leading Artemisia to assume the role for herself. Her authority was not limited to the city of Halicarnassus, it extended to the broader region known as Caria. During the Greco-Persian Wars, particularly in the second Persian invasion of Greece, when King Xerxes led the Achaemenid Empire, Artemisia played an active role in the conflict. She led her armies and naval forces as a loyal vassal of Persia against the independent Greek city-states. The primary source documenting Artemisia's involvement in these events is Herodotus in his work, Histories. Herodotus frequently praised Artemisia for her actions in battle, to the extent that Plutarch, many centuries later, criticised him for focusing more on Artemisia rather than the battles. Herodotus introduced her as one of the officers in the Persian army. I pass over all the other officers because there is no need for me to mention them, except for Artemisia, because I find it particularly remarkable that a woman should have taken part in the expedition against Greece. 
She took over the tyranny after the death of her husband, and although she had a grown-up son and did not have to join the expedition, her manly courage impelled her to do so. Hers was the second most famous squadron in the entire navy after the one from Sidon. None of Xerxes' allies gave him better advice than her. In 480 BC, the King of Kings, Xerxes I, assembled a massive army estimated by modern scholars to have been between 50,000 and 300,000 soldiers, accompanied by a fleet of approximately 1,200 ships. After crossing the Hellespont, he began his march through the Greek mainland, with his fleet sailing alongside the land army. During this campaign, a significant event occurred when the Persian fleet was stationed near Mount Pelion. A fierce storm struck, resulting in the destruction of about a third of the Persian fleet, approximately 400 ships. In response to the Persian threat, the independent Greek city-states formed a coalition. They made a strategic decision to confront the Persians at two key locations. Thermopylae for the land battle and Artemisium for the naval engagement. At Thermopylae, the Greek forces put up a brave defence but were ultimately defeated, allowing the Persians to continue their land invasion. Meanwhile, the Greek navy engaged the Persian fleet in the Battle of Artemisium. Artemisia herself played a notable role in this conflict. The battle ended in a stalemate, the Persians reorganized their fleet and the Greeks retreated further south. Herodotus mentions that after the battle, the Greeks placed a bounty on Artemisia's head, offering 10,000 drachmas to the man who captured or killed her. Meanwhile, the Persian land army advanced and sacked and looted the city of Athens. However, the Athenians, under the guide of Themistocles, had already fled to the island of Salamis. As Xerxes regrouped and deliberated on his next course of action, he told Mardonius, the chief general of his army, to call upon the rest of the generals for a meeting. During the meeting, all the generals agreed that they should face the Greeks that were stationed in Salamis in a navy battle, all generals except Artemisia. She earnestly advised Xerxes to spare his ships and avoid a sea battle. She argued that the Persian fleet was at a significant disadvantage and questioned the necessity of risking everything by fighting at sea when the Persians already controlled Athens and most of Greece. She believed that the Persian forces could achieve their objectives more effectively by remaining near the land or advancing into the Peloponnese, a strategy that would ultimately lead to the dispersion of the Greek forces. Artemisia also highlighted the vulnerability of the Greek army's supply situation, suggesting that a patient approach would force the Greeks to abandon their positions. She warned that rushing into a sea battle could harm both the Persian fleet and the land campaign. Finally, she advised Xerxes to consider the loyalty and effectiveness of his allied forces, cautioning that some of them, notably the Egyptians, Cyprians, Cilicians and Pamphylians, were of little value. Herodotus mentions that when Xerxes heard the opinions of his generals, he liked Artemisia's advice but decided to follow the majority's decision. He believed that his fleet hadn't tried hard at Artemisium because he wasn't present, so this time he prepared to personally witness the sea battle. And so Xerxes and his entourage set up an observation camp on a hill's summit overlooking Salamis. From there, he ordered his fleet to initiate the attack. As the Persian fleet entered the straits, the battle commenced. Before long, the advantage shifted in favour of the Greeks. Their smaller, more agile triremes relentlessly rammed the Persian ships, causing considerable damage to their fleet. The Persian vessels, due to their size, found it challenging to manoeuvre effectively in the narrow waters. The Persians were in disarray. Artemisia was amongst the chaos. Herodotus writes, I cannot say exactly how each of the other barbarians or Greeks fought, but this is what happened to Artemisia and it gave her still higher esteem with the king. When the king's side was all in commotion, at that time Artemisia's ship was pursued by a ship of Attica. She could not escape for other allied ships were in front of her and hers was in the nearest to the enemy. So she resolved to do something which did in fact benefit her. 
As she was pursued by the Attic ship, she charged and rammed an allied ship with a Kalindian crew and Damasithemus himself, king of the Kalindians, aboard. I cannot say if she had some quarrel with him while they were still at the Hellespont, or whether she did this intentionally, or if the ship of the Kalindians fell in her path by chance, but when she rammed and sank it, she had the luck of gaining two advantages. When the captain of the Attic ship saw her ram a ship with a barbarian crew, he decided that Artemisia's ship was either Greek or a deserter from the barbarians fighting for them, so he turned away to deal with others. Thus, she happened to escape and not be destroyed, and it also turned out that the harmful thing which she had done won her exceptional esteem from Xerxes. It is said that the king, as he watched the battle, saw her ship round the other, and one of the bystanders said, Master, do you see how well Artemisia contends in the contest and how she has sunk an enemy ship? When he asked if the deed was truly Artemisia's, they affirmed it, knowing reliably the marking of her ship, and they supposed that the ruined ship was an enemy. As I have said, all this happened to bring her luck and also that no one from the Kalindian ship survived to accuse her. It is said that Xerxes replied to what was told him, my men have become women and my women men. The Persians suffered a massive defeat at the Battle of Salamis. Their remaining ships, including the one with Artemisia on board, retreated to Phaleron. Xerxes then convened a council to determine the next course of action. Mardonius, a chief general, proposed that he remained with 300,000 troops to continue the campaign against the Greeks. He advised his king to consider returning home, highlighting the Greeks' newfound confidence after their victory in the increasingly dangerous situation. While Xerxes found the suggestion appealing, he also acknowledged Artemisius' earlier accurate assessment of the disastrous battle and wanted to hear her opinion on this strategy. According to Herodotus, Artemisia told Xerxes, It is difficult, O king, to answer your plea for advice by saying that which is best, but in the present turn of affairs, I think it is best that you march back and that Mardonius, if he so wishes and promises to do as he says, be left here with those whom he desires. For if he subdues all that he offers to subdue, and prospers in his design, the achievement, sire, is yours, since it will be your servants who have accomplished it. If, on the other hand, the issue is contrary to the expectation of Mardonius, it is no great misfortune, so long as you and all that household of yours are safe. For while you and the members of your household are safe, many a time will the Greeks have to fight for their lives. As for Mardonius, if any disaster befalls him, it does not really matter, nor will any victory of the Greeks be a real victory when they have slain but your servant. As for you, you will be marching home after the burning of Athens, which was the whole purpose of your expedition. Artemisia convinced Xerxes to proceed with Mardonius' strategy and he left Greece. Artemisia herself was put in charge of safely transporting some of the children of Xerxes to the city of Ephesus in Asia Minor. After this, Herodotus never mentions her again. Mardonius and the rest of the Persian army would eventually be defeated by a coalition of the Greek city-states in the Battle of Plataea one year later. The only scholar who records anything about Artemisia after these events is Photius, the Patriarch of Constantinople. He mentions a legend about Artemisia in his work Bibliotheca, which was written during the 9th century AD. Photius claims that upon Artemisia's return to her homeland, she fell in love with a man named Dardanus. However, he rejected her love and in her anger, she blinded him. Nevertheless, her love for him persisted and deepened even further as time went on. Finally, Photius says that Artemisia plunged into the sea from the Lucadian hills, meeting a watery grave. Her body was later found and laid to rest nearby. Modern scholars reject this story for many reasons. Firstly, it was recorded a staggering 13th centuries after her death, which of course raises doubts about its credibility due to the significant passage of time. Secondly, this story is not mentioned by any other source. 
And thirdly, the notion of both men and women succumbing to love and falling from the cliffs of Lercada was a widespread legend in ancient times. As we've noted earlier, a similar tale is associated with the death of Sappho. Hence, it is highly probable that this story is merely a myth. Artemisia's fame extended throughout Greece and Persia and her legacy has endured for thousands of years. Ancient Greek historians consistently praised Artemisia for participating in battles and for her strategic thinking. In his work, The Description of Greece, Parsenius notes that the Spartans erected a marble statue of her in the agora of the city, specifically within the Persian hall built from the spoils of victory over the Persians. Number 5. Hidna Among the women on this list, Hidna is the one whose life we know the least about. Nevertheless, she received much praise from the ancient Greeks for her deeds and as a result, she has rightfully claimed her place in this video. Hidna was from the city of Scioni, which was a Greek Ionian settlement located in the Halkidiki Peninsula. She lived during the late 6th and early 5th century BC. Her father, Scilius, was a renowned swimmer and diver who imparted his skills to her. The main sources that have documented her father's actions were two Greek historians, Herodotus and Pausanias. Pausanias recounts a significant event during the second Persian invasion of Greece in 480 BC in which Scilius and his daughter Hydna played a pivotal role in aiding the Greek army. As mentioned in the previous section on Artemisia, when the Persian fleet was anchored near Mount Pelion, a violent storm suddenly erupted, resulting in the destruction of one third of the Persian fleet. According to Parsinius, during the storm, Scilius and Hydna took it upon themselves to further sabotage the Persian fleet. They bravely dived into the raging sea and began cutting the ropes that secured the anchors of as many Persian ships as they could reach. Consequently, Parsenius asserts that the Persians suffered significantly higher casualties than they would have originally faced. Herodotus, on the other hand, presents a notably different account of the story. According to his narrative, Scilius was in the employ of the Persians. In his version, during the storm, Scilius, being a skilled diver, seized the opportunity to retrieve valuable treasures from the sunken Persian ships. He returned some of these treasures to the Persians while keeping others for himself. At this point, Scilius had already contemplated defecting to the Greek side and witnessing the devastation of the Persian fleet provided his chance. Herodotus states that Scilius travelled from the sea near Pelion to Artemisium either by swimming or, more likely, by boat. He played a pivotal role in informing the Greeks about the partial destruction of the Persian fleet, which ultimately led to the Greeks taking a stand at Artemisium. Notably, the account of Herodotus has no mention of Hydna. This omission parallels the situation we encountered earlier with Telesila of Argus, where Herodotus records an event but does not mention one of the key figures mentioned by later writers. According to Pausanias, in the aftermath of the Greek victory over the Persians during the second invasion, statues of Greek heroes, including both Hydna and her father, were erected at Delphi. Pausanias also records that the statue of Hydna was later transported to Rome by Emperor Nero, who claimed it along with numerous other statues and treasures from Delphi. While the occurrence of the event where Scilius, with or without his daughter, sabotaged the Persian fleet remains uncertain, if it did indeed happen, it is noteworthy that despite her absence in the writings of Herodotus, the presence of her statue and the accounts from later historians suggest that the ancient Greeks regarded Hydna as a great hero. Number 6. 